Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a prayer that's, that's attributed to St. Patrick. And you know of St. Patrick. He's one of the patron saints of Ireland who's, who's uh, known not only for driving the snakes out of Ireland, that's an important uh, uh, service that he provided, but also, and, and uh, certainly more importantly, for bringing and, and helping the Christian faith to, to nurture and grow in Ireland. And al although the entire prayer is, is rather lengthy, too, too long to read here, hear, hear now just this portion of it uh, this morning. It goes like this. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lay down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of every man who speaks of me, Christ in the eyes that, that see me, Christ in the ear that hears me. Now, now, maybe already just hearing these words this morning has prompted some images in, in your mind uh, of Christ's presence and, and relationship with you and, and in your life. I'd, I'd like to share some, some images that came to me uh, through focusing on these three prepositions that St. Patrick used in the prayer. Just three of the preposi prepositions. He used a lot, but we'll just focus on three of them. Uh, behind is one. Beside. He didn't really use that word, but he said on his right and on his left, so I'm combining those into beside me uh, and, and before. So behind, beside, and before. And I'm going to add one more preposition uh, of my own to that, and it's really, I suppose, a prepositional phrase, because it's two words, instead of, Christ instead of me. Now, the image that, that strikes me regarding Christ behind me is really a, a verbal image. Um, and ex it's expressed in the phrase uh, very commonly, he's got my back, or she's got my back. That's a very common phrase in these past few years, got your back. It can mean many different things and be applied in, in many different situations. But generally, it includes elements of support, right, of defense, Protection, help, caring, sticking up for, whether the, the danger or challenge is, is seen or unseen, it may be known or, or even unknown, slight or, or considerable. It might be verbal or physical or emotional, spiritual, and it might be a long-term um, situation or perhaps only a short-term situation. But I'll bet, at least I hope, you've felt it in your own life when someone has your back. And you probably also felt it was what it was like, sadly, probably maybe has happened, and you felt what it was like when someone did not have your back and you wish that they would have. Most likely, you've also been in that position to do that for someone else as well, to, to, to have their back. Now, if we humans, if we humans can depend on each other to have our backs, how much more can we depend on our God to have our back, to defend and protect us, not only from danger here on earth, but also from the ultimate danger brought by sin. When I look at the cross, it gives me a very graphic, graphic image that Jesus has our back. Jesus, whose very body, whose very back, was a, up against that cross and who cried out desperately for the Father to have his back. That same Jesus literally carried us on his back to the cross and had our back against the forces of Satan, of sin, and the forces of death that threatened to destroy us. Jesus is behind us. Now, when you think of the phrase, Christ beside me, what image comes to mind? Probably most of you are familiar with the, the poem, 
footprints in the sand. Um, and not only do you see a slide uh, of it here on the wall, but, but perhaps you noticed when you came into the narthex this morning, there's a print of it uh, hanging on, on a door uh, on the wall um, in, in the narthex. Uh, it's uh, the poem by Mary Stevenson. And as you recall, probably, the, the poem describes a dream of someone's life, the times when there were two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to the dreamer and the other belonging to the Lord, traveling together side by side. However, as you probably recall, the dreamer was disturbed and, and even dismayed to discover only one set of footprints during some times that were particularly difficult, were particularly troublesome. And the dreamer didn't understand how the Lord could leave during those times, during the times that he was most needed. Of course, of course, the Lord's reassuring reply was that the one set of footprints during those difficult times belonged to God himself, who had not left or abandoned the dreamer, but was carrying, physically carrying the dreamer through those times. That's God beside us, always present, always ready, always able to help, and even carrying us, picking up and carrying us, more than just accompanying us. Unfortunately, sometimes we ignore or even reject God's presence beside us, don't we? Perhaps thinking that we don't need him, uh, that we can do it on our own, or that he will ignore or even reject us. God's presence behind us, having our back, even to the cross, is a reminder that we need the assurance that God's presence is always beside us as well. And God before us, God before us. So many images could be considered there. Using another verbal image, I think of the old time hymn, probably many of you remember this too, Onward Christian Soldiers, right? Onward Christian Soldiers. That's one of the images that comes to my mind. The chorus itself, Onward Christian Soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before, going on before. That repeatedly reminds us that Jesus is going before us to serve as a beacon, as a, an advanced scout, as a protector, as a, as a standard bearer, as a guide, as a target. And the target that he guides us to is not always the easy path to take, not necessarily the way that we've gone before, and perhaps not even the way we expected or desired to go. But he goes ahead to prepare the way before us so that we can follow. Now for the, the image of God instead of us, I need to look actually no further than the cross again. Imagine Jesus hanging on that cross. Imagine the suffering that led up to it. Imagine the beatings and the whippings, the scorn and humiliation. Imagine the crown of thorns digging into his head. Imagine the nails piercing his hands and his feet and the sword piercing his side. Imagine the physical pain. Imagine the emotional pain of rejection, isolation, even abandonment by his father. And imagine what Jesus did to deserve all of that. Just imagine. The answer, of course, is that Jesus did nothing, nothing to deserve all of that. But we did, you and I, we did. Through sin, through our actions, through our treatment of others, and through our rejection of God himself, we deserved the pain of the cross. We deserved the pain of the cross. But Jesus took all of that on himself so that we didn't have to. He did it instead of us, instead of us. And so I think that we can rightly add this to the prayer of St. Patrick, Christ instead of me. In our gospel lesson for today, we, we heard some of the words of Jesus' high priestly prayer for his church. His church, including Bethlehem Lutheran Church, right here 
in Aloha, Oregon. And these words express his desire to be, to be behind us and beside us and before us and to die instead of us. He says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. <clears throat> Certainly one of the gifts that God gives his church is pastors, whom he has selected and chosen uh, to reveal and proclaim his love and his grace and his will for us. And not pastors only, not pastors only, others as well, DCEs and teachers and ministers of worship and music and ministers of children and, and youth and lay leaders and servants in many, many different um, capacities. But for now, we'll consider pastors. For now, we'll consider pastors. Now, I've been a member at Bethlehem for over 48 years now. I know not as long as some of you, uh, but also longer than some others. And, and please know that, that I don't claim any special wisdom or authority based on this tenure. That's not why I'm saying that. But, but perhaps it does give me a, a perspective that I'd like to share with you by talking about four, four, four of our previous uh, pastors. Richard Brain, Dean Pingle, Jonathan Dinger, and Jeffrey Shearer. Now, I, and I believe that each of these men was led by God to serve his people and to serve with his people, to serve with us here at a particular time in a particular way and for a particular purpose in leading us to the ministry that God calls all of us to. And each was led by God to end their formal ministry here, whether by retirement or by being called to serve elsewhere in his kingdom. And uh, I'll admit that I may not have understood and perhaps not even agreed with, um, as if it were up to me, not, uh, not understood uh, God's leading these men elsewhere, but I trust in his wisdom and judgment in directing the ministry, not only here, but in all parts and locations in his kingdom. Now, although I wasn't here during the, the earliest years of Pastor Brame's ministry, I was here, I was here for the last 15 years or so, and during his ministry, this young congregation, very young congregation at that time, learned to worship and serve together, to know God's deep and abiding love for them, to truly care for and love each other and, for the, and love the people in this community. And what a joy and blessing it is for us that some of Pastor Brame's family is still here and still a part of this caring and loving church family even today. Now, and relying on this caring and loving community, Pastor Pingle came. Pastor Pingle led this congregation, I believe, to a resurgence and refocus on worship, on worship as a central emphasis of Bethlehem Lutheran Church. With the completion of this sanctuary, Sunday morning worship became not only the means for spiritual growth and nurture for our members, but also the primary opportunity for outreach to this greater community that we live in. And because of a loving and caring community that had God-pleasing worship as its focus, Pastor Dinger led us to a broader understanding of our mission, uh, perhaps encapsulized best in the, the mission statement that is uh, painted on the, uh, on the wall uh, below the, the balcony there, to build the family of God through relationship with Jesus Christ. That mission challenged us and enabled us to seek ways and to find resources to intentionally reach out into the community to share the good news of God's love. Most recently, Pastor Shearer has built upon the experiences and priorities expressed by our previous pastors. 
Although, honestly, I think it's probably too early to, to articulate a definitive perspective on pastors, uh, Pastor Sheary's ministry leadership here. Certainly, there are some things to highlight, I think. Uh, un undeniably, the response to COVID and the pandemic closures, the pandemic shutdowns, uh, taught us to consider new and different ways and technologies of doing church and of reaching out to people, people both nearby and people at a distance that we wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise. And we have continued to serve and connect with the community in very intentional ways through service opportunities such as Family Promise. And in, in his last Star article, Pastor Jeff himself said that he felt that his ministry skills, his ministry skills were best suited to prepare a congregation to discover what's next. To discover what's next. And we're anxious for that, aren't we? Anxious to discover what's next. And especially anxious, perhaps, to discover who's next. Who's next to serve as a pastor leading us in the ministry that God is calling all of us to here at Bethlehem. Now, a phrase comes to mind when I think about the pastors who have led in the ministry in these past years, and I really think this phrase was first put in my mind by one of these uh, former pastors. And honestly, I, I, I'm pretty sure I had a conversation with him about it, but I don't remember which one. So I won't attribute it to, to any of them, except to, to say that, that uh, I think all of them you know, may have considered it. And that phrase is standing on the shoulders of giants. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, and again, as I said, I wouldn't be surprised at all to think that each of these men, each of these men might have thought about that phrase and maybe even spoken that phrase when they considered their predecessors in that office, in the, the office of a pastor of the, the public ministry here at Bethlehem Lutheran Church, standing on the shoulders of giants. Likewise, I imagine that the next pastor, whoever he is and whenever he may come, I imagine that he might consider that phrase as well, standing on the shoulders of giants. And yet, even more important than using this phrase and remembering these men whom God has placed in ministry leadership is to remember the God who was always with us, who is behind us and beside us and before us, who died on the cross instead of us. Yes, it's, it's good to recognize that we have been and always will be standing on the shoulders of giants. But it's even more important and encouraging and comforting to remember and recognize that we are carried in the arms of Christ. Carried in the arms of Christ. That's the constant. That's the assurance. That's the reliance for God's people on earth. And it's our reliance here at Bethlehem as well. Throughout our history, during our vacancy, and into our future, into our future, we are carried in the arms of Christ. Now, we've already had an image of, of uh, uh, footprints in the sand, uh, sand the, uh, 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 so, but I'd like to share another image um, to, to introduce uh, this, this concept to you. And that, uh, that image is to introduce you to Lola. Yes, yes, that's her real name. This is Lola. Now, some of you know that, that Chris and I recently returned from our very first trip to Hawaii, island of, of Oahu. Uh, as first-time visitors, we did many of the first-time visitor touristy activities that probably, hopefully, a lot of you have done or maybe look forward to doing. But we, since we didn't rent a car, that meant tour buses were our, were our primary mode of transportation. That's where we met Lola because she was one of our tour bus drivers. And that was pretty remarkable, actually, considering that Lola was, was barely five feet tall, barely five feet tall, and she was, uh, you know, she, she drove and managed this, this, tour, this tour bus that looked like one of these. Actually, Lola's bus is, is kind of the one in the middle there, and it's kind of uh, hidden by, by the other ones. 
Uh, you see the, the one on the left, the, the bright yellow one. They're all very similar, but, uh, but Lola was a driver of that tour bus, very remarkable. And the bus itself was pretty remarkable. I don't know how many of you have been on buses like this. Maybe you've even driven buses like this. But it was very long and very large and very high off the ground. So high that, that she had to lower the steps so that passengers could, could actually board the bus. And there were at least two steps up to the level, to the seat level where Lola sat, and she was surrounded by an instrument panel that reminded me of a cockpit in an airplane. Um, uh, uh, so there were two steps up to that seat, and then there were at least another two steps up to the platform where the passengers were seated. So this was a, a, a large, large vehicle. Uh, and I'm, I'm not really sure how long the bus actually was. I didn't step it off. But I can say this, it carried 50, 57 passengers and had room for a restroom on board as well. It was a big vehicle. It was a big vehicle. And Lola, all five feet nothing of her, she drove it masterfully through heavy traffic and, and tight parking spots and then also along the, the, the more wide open but, and picturesque, but still very curvy and narrow and dangerous roads. And of course, as a tour bus driver, Lola maintained a constant chatter, a constant chatter. Um, she was describing geographical and historical and, and cultural highlights for us along the way, just keeping us, honestly, entertained and safe. And we did feel safe with Lola driving. Even Chris felt safe with Lola driving. So <laughs> she was in complete control of that bus. And of course, she could not be in com complete control of what happened outside the bus. A situation did, did develop during the drive when Lola had to respond to sudden traffic slow down ahead of us. And she responded well. She responded well, calmly, at least outward appearance, calmly reacting in a way that maintained maintain control and slowed the bus as needed. But she did something else at the same time as she was maintaining control, something that most of us uh, can probably relate to because we've probably done it ourselves probably many times as well. Can you guess what she did as she was controlling the bus and slowing it down so that we would avoid a collision? She put out her right arm. She put out her right arm as if to protect the passengers from whatever impact or collision or damage might result uh, from what happened. As if, as if the short little woman sitting two steps below 57 passengers sitting two steps above her and 30 feet behind her, as if this little woman could do anything to protect us from being thrown forward. And now after the situation cleared up, Lola joked with those of us who were sitting close enough to, to, uh, to witness it and, and talk to her about it. Um, she, she joked with us that, that it was her natural reaction as a mom, as a mom. Can you relate to that? Moms and dads and grandmas and, and grandpas and other drivers of buses. Um, and, and, and certainly, certainly we can, and we've done it, and we'll continue to do it. And it certainly is not only an intentional action, it is, but it's more than an intentional active, it's instinctive, isn't it? It's instinctive to reach out to protect our little ones. It's instinctive. Now, it's, it strikes me that we can apply this same image of reaching out an arm for protection that, that Lola demonstrated to us and that we can imagine for ourselves, because we've done it before, we can apply this same image to our Lord. And not just one arm. Look again at the cross. Look at the cross. The horizontal cross piece on the cross reaches both ways. It reaches both ways. Jesus stretches out both of his arms to protect us. And not only to protect, but to bend down, to reach down, to pick us up, and to carry us not only through times of danger and challenge, but also through times of comfort and assurance, through times of growth and nurturing, of prosperity and peace. It's his very nature, isn't it? God's nature 
is to love us as his dear children, to care for and protect us, to strengthen and sustain us, to bring us home to him, to bring us home to him. That's a message that we hear clearly in our gospel lesson for the day, really, really in all of our scripture lessons for the day. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing that that's God's nature because, because our nature is just the opposite. Our nature is the opposite. Our nature is sin. It's turning away from God. It's rejecting him and his love for us. And it's rejecting our neighbor's needs in favor of our own. Our nature leads us to getting what we deserve. Present and eternal punishment. Our nature leads to death. But God's nature wins out. God's nature wins out. God's nature is grace. Grace that gives us what we don't deserve. God's nature reaches down when we don't deserve it. God's nature picks us up. God's nature carries us, carries us in his arms, literally in his outstretched arms, home to him. So there's one more image that I, I'd like to share with you that, that kind of depicts this for me in a, in a graphic way. This is an image that I found when I was doing an internet search. And this image is actually from the chancel wall at Trinity Lutheran Church in Denver, Colorado. Heather, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but this is from the wall at Trinity Lutheran Church in, in Denver. Now it shows the Savior on the cross, arms outstretched, arms outstretched both ways on the cross. But I believe that his arms are not hanging down in defeat, but actually raised in victory as if to gather all of his people in so that he can carry them home. Arms that have already borne the entire punishment for sin in the world. Arms that are stretched out, prepared to carry his people home to him. May God grant that to all of us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now may the peace of God keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.